Okay. Uh, so welcome to the seminar today. And uh, we have uh, our speaker today is Alexandre Serantis from Barcelona. And uh, he spent some time in India and from where I know him. And, and then uh, he, he, he moved to Warsaw and uh, then now he's in Barcelona. And he has been working on uh, large order behavior of hydrodynamics uh, recently with, uh, uh, with people at Warsaw basically. And, uh, and uh, we will hear about his exciting uh, developments from him on this topic. Uh, so over to Alexandre now, over to Alex. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation, Ayan. I'm really happy to be sharing this virtual venue with all of you. So the topic that we'll be discussing today, as I said, is the large order behavior of relativistic hydrodynamics. And what I'm going to tell you about is based on three papers written in collaboration with Michal Heller, Michal Spalinski, Victor Svensson, and Ben Withers. So uh, I guess that I don't need to motivate the importance of relativistic hydrodynamics to this audience, but just to put everybody on the same page, I'm going to remind you that relativistic hydrodynamics provides an effective theory description of the late time and long range behavior of any relativistic medium endowed with conserved quantities. And this effective theory description is based on a key organizing principle, which is a gradient expansion around local thermal equilibrium. And due to its universal scope, uh, relativistic hydrodynamics is an indispensable tool when it comes to model real world phenomena and finds applications in fields as diverse as nuclear physics, astrophysics, or even some condensed matter physics situations. And despite its scientific importance and long history, I think it is fair to say that there are still fundamental aspects of relativistic hydrodynamics which are waiting to be fully understood. Now this comment applies in particular to the systematic inclusion of stochastic effects in relativistic hydrodynamics, which is a thriving business in some parts of India. But this is not the front that we are going to attack on this talk. So in this talk, we are going to assume that we are dealing with a system with a sufficiently large number of local degrees of freedom in su such a way that these stochastic effects can be completely neglected. And we are going to focus on a particular question, which is the large order behavior of this gradient expansion that relativistic hydrodynamics is based upon. Now, from a physical standpoint, improving our knowledge of the gradient expansion in relativistic hydrodynamics is crucial in order to understand better what is the applicability regime of relativistic hydrodynamics when you truncate it at low order, keeping only the first few terms in this gradient expansion, okay? And now uh, we all appreciate the fact that ADS-CFT has provided us with a first principle framework in which we can study the out of equilibrium dynamics of strongly coupled quantum fields and therefore uh, ADS-CFT offers an invaluable tool to analyze how this out of equilibrium strongly coupled quantum fields evolve until reaching a regime well described by relativistic hydrodynamics. And uh, these studies in ADS-CFT started more than 10 years ago with the motivation of understanding better the success of relativistic hydrodynamics in the modeling of the quark gluon plasma for the, formed in nuclear collisions. And the main lesson that stems from them is that there is a difference between the hydrodynamization time, this time being the time at which relativistic hydrodynamics when truncated at low order becomes applicable and describes successfully the stress energy tensor of these thermalizing states and the local equilibration time, which is the time for the system to attain a regime of local thermal equilibrium. Okay, so here you have an example of the difference between the hydrodynamization time and the local equilibration time, which I took for this paper uh, from 2011, written by Michal, Janik, and Witachchik. And in it, you see the time evolution of the pressure and isotropy as a function of uh, a time variable measured in units of the local temperature. So here you see the relativistic hydrodynamics, which is represented by these dotted curves, can capture successfully this pressure and isotropy, even when this pressure and isotropy is not small as it should be in the local equilibrium regime, but rather large. Okay, 
So this was an observation that popped out over and over and over in these early ADSCFT studies of hydrodynamization, and it motivated further research into its origin. And of course, understanding the applicability regime of relativistic hydrodynamics, it's a question which it's ultimately intimately connected to the asymptotic behavior of this gradient expansion. For instance, you can imagine that when relativistic hydrodynamics becomes applicable, in this regime, which is still far from local thermal equilibrium, this is due to the fact that the gradient expansion is converting very fast to a finite value. And until recently, uh, explicit studies of the larger behavior of the gradient expansion had been restricted to a specific classes of fluid flows of a commoving nature, which are effectively zero plus one dimensional. And among these commoving fluid flows, the most studied example has been Bjorken flow due to its connection with the physics of the quark gluon plasma. So uh, in Bjorken flow, so let's imagine that we are in four dimensional Minkowski space. So to define Bjorken flow, you have to single out a particular spatial direction, which I'm going to refer to as the longitudinal direction and the time direction. As you assume that the dynamics in the transverse spatial directions are uh, translational invariant and isotropic. So the dynamics are only non-trivial in the longitudinal plane spanned by this longitudinal spatial coordinate and the time. And furthermore, in Bjorken flow, you also postulate that the dynamics in this longitudinal flame, frame are, uh, plane are boost invariant in the sense that, for instance, if you consider the expectation value of the energy momentum tensor, it only depends on the proper time on this longitudinal plane, which is related to the Minkowski time and this uh, single doubt special Minkowski coordinate in this way. Okay, now, uh, if you are considering a conformal fluid, it turns out that the condition that the stress energy tensor is traceless combined with the conservation equations imply that you can write the longitudinal pressure and the transverse pressure purely in, term, in terms of the energy density. So the only non-trivial field that you have to consider for a conformally invariant Bjorken flow is the energy density. Now, uh, relativistic hydrodynamics uh, predicts for you the form of the energy density as a function of the proper time in Bjorken flow in terms of an asymptotic series expansion in inverse powers of the proper time. Okay, and this, this asymptotic series expansion takes this form. And with the motivation of understanding what is the larger behavior of the series expansion, uh, Heller, Janik, and Gutachik computed it in ADSCFT in 2013. And the result was that this, this uh, inverse proper time expansion was factorially divergent. Okay, so you can see here uh, and what their computation ultimately led to. So here we are plotting the root test as a function of the order and as applied to the coefficients of this uh, one over time expansion. And you see that this quantity increases linearly, implying that the gradient expansion is diverging factorially. Okay. And Further, this observation, of course, motivated further studies into the nature of hydrodynamic gradient expansions in Bjorken flow. And these studies were performed in frameworks such as, the, as diverse as Mueller's Rosetard theories, kinetic theory, or holography. And apart from one known counterexample that I'm going to discuss in detail during the talk, it was always found that these hydrodynamic gradient expansions were factorially divergent in commoving flows. Now, uh, a natural consequence of this observation is that the mathematically correct way of thinking about the gradient expansion is as nothing but the perturbative sector of a trans-series that represents the energy momentum tensor. So this SH here represents the gradient expansion that I was referring to before, expressed in uh, inverse powers of the proper time. And to have a self-consistent description of the full energy momentum tensor, this factorially divergent uh, late time expansion has to be upgraded to a trans series, which contains uh, a number of number perturbative sectors. And by the phenomenon of resurgence, the are sort of behavior of this perturbative trans series, the, this perturbative piece of the trans series is governed by the non perturbative physics that fixes the non-perturbative trans-series sector. Now, in common flows, it was observed that these non-perturbative physics are nothing but the transient modes of the underlying microscopic theory. 
And this observation uh, ultimately suggests that the applicability of relativistic heterodynamics sets in when the transient contributions to the energy momentum tensor have decayed sufficiently, which is a condition that might be related to, but it's not uh, ultimately reliant on the size of the gradient corrections to the leading order perfect fluid behavior. Okay, so the goal of this talk. Uh, just uh, one question, Alex. Yes. Uh, yeah. yes. So, in, uh, so in the context of, I think, relativistic kinetic theory has been worked out, but uh, but I don't think they maybe uh, haven't seen it. So, where is the information of the initial conditions uh, here? Uh, the information so of the initial conditions would be contained in uh, the, contained the parameters that appear in the non-perturbative transverse spectrum. Exactly. It would be contained right. in the so-called yeah. transverse parameter. Usually, the, the transverse parameter. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And uh, okay, maybe you will come to that later. Is there a systematic uh, way to understand uh, so what parameters to choose so that you are on that tractor? Maybe you'll... That's an excellent question. And I don't have a clear cut answer to it. I don't think this question is understood in full generality. Because I also think that the proper definition of the hydrodynamic attractor is something that needs to be made sharper, in a sense. For a particular okay, definition, okay, so... what you mean by a hydrodynamic attractor, I don't think there is a systematic understanding of how to choose the transitive parameters such that you are on top of it. Hmm. But I might be wrong. Yeah, I'm but... not an expert in hydrodynamic attractors. Ah, I see. Yeah. Okay. So usually in the context of holography, they said that uh, you have to choose this uh, body, this uh, this Yorkian resummation contour uh, on the real axis. Uh, mm -hmm. it, that's probably true only for the case of uh, that seems to be true for Einstein gravity. That I think was a prescription for uh, this thing. But I uh, I don't understand. Like, is it simply an observation or is it something you expect? Uh, uh, okay, so that was just a comment, and maybe you are going to be, you are going to come to that. It was only in the context of York and Throat they had this. Uh, yeah, I, had I this. actually I have to. I want to be absolutely clear for the very beginning, so I will not be discussing hydrodynamic attractors in this talk. Ah, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> we are not going. I'm not going to be discussing hydrodynamic attractors at all. Sorry for that. Okay. Probably yeah, okay. the next time. Probably the next time you invite me, I'm going to be able to say something more. <laughs> but this time uh, we are all just right. going to focus. All right. On the actual behavior of the perturbative uh, part of the trans series, and that's all. So I'm not okay. going to discuss uh, trans series in relativistic hydrodynamics uh, for non-commutative flows. Basically. Hmm. Okay. So okay. Sure. That, that, that is yeah. the, that is of course that is the medium-term goal that we would like to fully comp you know sets a medium-term goal for future research. But we are not at this person mm -hmm. I'm speaking. I'm not. The, at the point of mm. being able to say something definite about this this question. Mm. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, okay. So, uh, well, so just to clarify what the goal of the talk is, <laughs> since we already had a small discussion about it. So the goal of this talk is to discuss whether uh, the lessons of the commoving flow studies for the gradient expansion hold in general, or whether they rely essentially on the underlying symmetry restrictions that these flows obey. And with this goal in mind, I have divided this talk into three parts. So the part, the first part is going to be short, and it's going to focus on the gradient expansion in the linear response regime. In the second part, I will present the first explicit computations of the gradient expansion for non-commoving flows. And in the third part, I'm going to discuss a new look into the large order behavior of the gradient expansion which is based on a notion I will refer to as a singulant and which I will introduce in due time. And just to be completely clear from the very beginning, I'm going to state now the specific question that we are going to be addressing in this talk. So we are going to work in the Landau frame and we are going to decompose the energy momentum tensor into a perfect fluid piece, which is expressed in terms of the energy density and the fluid velocity in the standard way, and a non-perfect fluid one, okay? So in the Landau frame, the energy density and the fluid velocity 
are the solutions of this eigenvalue problem set by the expectation value of the energy momentum tensor of your underlying microscopic field. We are going to consider exclusively conformal fluids placed in four-dimensional Minkowski space in such a way that the energy momentum tensor is going to be traceless. The pressure is going to be related to the energy density by the standard equation of state for a conformal fluid. And this dissipative part of the total energy momentum tensor is going to be traceless as well. Okay, so this piece is transverse and it's traceless. Now for us, classical hydrodynamics as an effective field theory is going to be defined by the, oh, sorry, is going to be defined by the constitutive relations, which are going to express the dissipative part of the energy momentum tensor as an infinite series of space-time gradients acting on our hydrodynamic fields, which are the energy density and the fluid velocity. Now, the nth term in this gradient expanded constitutive relations is going to contain the tensor structures involving n derivatives of these hydrodynamic fields, which are allowed by underlying symmetries of your microscopic conformal field theory. And these tensor structures are going to be weighted by a particular transport coefficients, which cannot be fixed at the level of the effective theory alone, but rather need to be determined in terms of the underlying microscopic theory by a matching computation that might employ, for instance, a Kubo formula. Okay, so the specific question that we are going to address is what is the larger behavior of these gradient expanded constitutive relations when they are evaluated on a particular fluid flow? So the operational procedure that you have to keep in mind is that you have an experimental each friend that measures a given out of equilibrium energy momentum tensor, hands it to you and asks you, is this out of equilibrium energy momentum tensor described by relativistic hydrodynamics or not? So the way we are choosing to answer that question is to find the energy density, find the fluid velocity, evaluate the constitutive relations, and check whether the dissipative tensor they predict agrees with the dissipative tensor that has been measured or not. Okay, so is any question regarding to this point? Okay, uh, good. So, okay, so I'm going to start by discussing this gradient expansion in the linear response regime for the following reason. So we found out in 2020 that if you pay the price of restricting yourself to infinitesimal fluctuations around thermal equilibrium, then you can achieve a general result that applies to arbitrary fluid flows without any symmetry restrictions. So here we are trading genericity of the flow. We're trading the nonlinearity of the flow for the genericity of the flow in this approach. Okay. So to discuss the gradient expansion in the linear response regime, we are going to focus on the most general purely spatial formulation of the gradient expansion. So here, Latin indices are going to refer to spatial directions. Um, we are going to be working in the rest frame of the fluid and taking into account the transversality condition, but focusing only on the spatial part of the tensors we are interested in, okay? So it turns out that the most general formulation of the, of the gradient expansion of the constitutive relations in the linear response regime is built upon three basic tensor structures, which are the shear tensor sigma that you can see here. So here's small u is the velocity fluctuation with respect to the rest frame for velocity of the fluid. Uh, you also have this pi u tensor and this pi epsilon tensor, which are nothing but the action of this uh, linear differential operator on your, the scalars and the rotation group that you have at your disposal, which are the energy density fluctuation and the divergence of the velocity fluctuation. Now, so Alex, this is without assuming any special symmetry. This is the most general structures that can appear. This is the most general structure. Yeah, this is the most general structure. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So the fact that you only consider, uh, you can only consider differential operators which are linear in the underlying hydrodynamic variables, in this case, energy density fluctuation and velocity fluctuation. And due to the linearity condition, this is the most general, these are the most general tensor structures that you can have for a conformal fluid. Okay. Yeah, maybe then I can ask a stupid question. What goes wrong? Suppose if you take del J, sigma J, okay. Um, 
like how, how did you how do you see that how do you see this should be uh, indeed the most general well you basically you basically classify the building blocks the elementary building blocks that you have in terms of scalars mm -hmm. for instance under the rotation group for instance uh, energy density fluctuation is a scalar divergence of velocity is a scalar and two tensors which would be for instance these two tensors here you can see you can see my cursor right yeah yeah yeah, so this two tensor or the Euclidean metric. Mm. Okay. And then you just assemble this into pieces which are individually transverse, which you have already taken into account by working only with the spatial part of the tensors and traceless. And that's it. Mm. That's it. So you have elementary building blocks that you have to assemble into stru elementary structures, elementary tensor structures that have this property. So they have to be transverse, they can get off. Symmetric and traceless because we are dealing with a conformal fluid, and you get yeah. Three. But uh, uh, what happens? Suppose you take a di del j sigma j i and another derivative. Uh, how can you show that this is this produces some other use of Euler equations and show that should be equivalent to something else? Or sorry, can you can you repeat the question? Uh, so suppose if I do. Uh, del j of uh, partial j of sigma j i and uh, and i take another derivative it produces a tensor then i can take its uh, symmetric transverse and traceless part of that you got you so, can you, i think you can re-express them in terms of the other ones uh, by using all your equations the zero yeah. order yes. Order yes. yes 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 that's yeah this is important so this formulation Assumes that you have made a maximum use, of, maximal use of the conservation equations. Yeah. So on shell, this is only it's on shell. On shell exactly. Yeah, okay. It is completely. Yeah. Exactly. Thanks. Thanks for the point. It is completely on shell. Okay. It is thanks. completely on shell. Uh, it's it's the point I was about to make. So the point is that, from the perspective of the rotation group, you have two scalar differential operators. One is the special Laplacian, and another is partial, you know, partial t. But here you would see that we are not employing partiality because we assume that we have employed the conservation equations to replace all the derivatives along the fluid flow, which would be corresponding to partiality by transverse derivatives. Okay. So this, this is completely on shell. It makes a maximal use of the conservation equations to construct this purely spatial formulation of the gradient expansion. Okay. So in this sense, we have the three elementary building blocks, and we due to this um construction so, so due to the fact that we can employ the conservation equations to replace partial t's by transverse derivatives we take these operators a b and c to be an arbitrary to be well expressed as an infinite series expansion in uh, spatial Laplacian. okay and its coefficient in this infinite series expansion is a transport coefficient which we cannot fix by the usage of the symmetries of the fluid flow alone but which have to, has to be determined, as I said, in terms of the microscopic coefficient, the microscopic theory by a matching computation, okay? So the way in which we decided to perform this matching computation was to fix these transport coefficients in terms of the hydrodynamic shear and sound modes of the underlying microscopic theory. And the end result that you get is the following. For instance, the coefficients of this piece, the AN coefficients, can be expressed as a particular term in the small, K expansion of the shear mode frequency, the hydrodynamic shear mode frequency represented here by a perp, and likewise for the BN and CN transfer coefficients. Okay, so omega perp is a hydrodynamic shear mode, and omega parallel with a plus or a minus represents a hydrodynamic sound mode. So the expressions that you get are basically telling you that the transport coefficients that appear in these gradient expanded constitutive relations can be expressed in terms of particular coefficients of the small momentum expansion of the hydrodynamic shear and sound mode frequencies of your underlying microscopic theory. And the usefulness of these expressions, okay, and now, now we want to find out what is the larger behavior of this gradient expansion when we evaluate it on a particular fluid flow. So to quantify this, we need to know the larger behavior of the transport coefficients and the larger behavior of the derivative operators acting on our hydrodynamic fields. So the utility of these expressions is that the larger the behavior of the transport coefficients is, according to, they, to them, ultimately related to the analyticity properties of the hydrodynamic mode frequencies of your underlying microscopic theory. 
And I'm not going to enter into details because I want to jump um, soon enough to the results that we have at the fully nonlinear level. But the question of what are the analyticity properties of hydrodynamic modes has been under intense scrutiny in the ADSFT context uh, in recent years. And there is a wealth of evidence pointing to the fact that this hydrodynamic um, shear and sound mode frequencies in ADSCFT are not entire functions of the spatial momentum. Okay. And this is the experimental evidence that we have at our disposal uh, pertaining to this fact. You can also argue that this has to follow from relativistic causality. But the point is that these objects here, this omega perp and omega parallel plus minus, have complex singularities in the complex momentum plane. And assuming that this is true, what you find out is that the relative behavior of the transport coefficient is going to be controlled by critical momenta, which are going to be related to these singularities in the complex k plane. So for instance, the relative behavior of the AN transport coefficients is going to be quantified by a critical momenta, momentum that here I'm calling K star R, which is nothing but the singularity of the right hand side of this matching condition, which is closest to the origin in the complex momentum plane. Okay. So the point of the non-entire non nature of the hydrodynamic shear and sound mode frequencies is that the larger behavior of the transport coefficients that appear in these gradient expanded constitutive relations is going to be geometric. Okay. And now you can argue that the larger behavior of the spatial derivative operators when acting on a particular fluid flow is going to be controlled by the support of your hydrodynamic fields, energy density and fluid velocity in momentum space, which we are going to call K max. And I'm not going to enter into details into this point because it's more math uh, Alex uh, just yes. one question yes. in principle you can you are you are having three complex uh, singularities corresponding to three different expansions in principle yes yes you mean for the a b uh, and c piece yes yeah 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 they would be fixed by the singularities of omega perp and omega parallel according to this formula yeah but in reality are they, do they coincide or are they different three pieces in general uh, i think they would be different yeah, okay. General, they would be. I think it would be different. I think there is no okay. uh, first principle reason why they should coincide. So, mm -hmm. since we are meant to be fully general, let us assume that they don't. Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, now this question is that if ANs are real or complex or. Uh, Sorry, which, which question? ANs? Uh, these ANs no, they are real. no, they are real. No, they are real. real. They are real. Oh, yes, they are real. Due to the due to the properties of this, due to the properties of you see, this is purely imaginary. It comes with an eye, so it's real. Hmm. Same here, and due to the yeah, properties, but... due to the symmetry properties of these objects uh, with respect to the imaginary oh. axis, these are also real. Yeah, but usually it is, isn't it expected that these singularities are in the complex plane, not in the real plane? Not no, to, they not, are, not no, real no, no, no. I'm, I'm telling you, the transport coefficients are real. Now, the singularity doesn't have to be real, but what controls the larger ah, it's a mod the norm. norm. Okay, it's a mod. Uh, it's a norm. norm. Yeah, exactly. It's a norm. Uh, it's but a norm. from the behavior of the transport coefficients, is there a way to find this uh, uh, location of the complex on the complex plane where it is? Um, I would, I don't know, probably by studying the subleading, because this is only this is only the leading larger behavior. So. Probably by studying the subleading behavior, you can say something. Yeah, otherwise you have to really do this. Uh, yeah, things, yeah. Like I, what Faso does and all of that. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, actually, if you want to discuss this more, uh, I have I have some plots in my backup slides uh, regarding precisely this okay. point. But, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I guess that you can extract information by studying the subleading corrections to the leading order behavior. Oh, okay, thanks. But I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, so just taking into account, so let me, so just going back on track, just taking into account uh, this observation, you can put forward the final convergence criterion for this gradient expanded constitutive relations when evaluated on a particular fluid flow, which is that the gradient expansion 
is going to be a convergent series if the support of the fluctuations under time derivatives is smaller than the microscopic momentum scale defined by the minimum of the absolute value of these three critical momenta. And if the support exceeds, exceeds this um, critical microscopic momentum scale, then the series is going to be divergent. And this includes, in particular, the case of uh, hydrodynamic fluctuations, which are not compactly supported in momentum space. And in particular, a factorial divergence requires that the support of the hydrodynamic fields in momentum space is unbounded, which is the expected generic behavior for a uh, excitation, which is well localized in position space. So the take home point of this- Sorry, what do you mean by the support exit case? I mean, what's the- That if you, for instance, size, uh... yeah, for instance, if you, let's say you have a flow, which is effectively one plus one dimensional, okay? And you consider uh, a Gaussian, right? in real space as your initial data. Well, the Gaussian in momentum space is also not compactly supported. So in this case, you would predict that the gradient expansion evaluated on any given space-time point along the flow would be factorially divergent. I have an example in the next slide, in the next slide, just to illustrate the point. And sorry, what does divergence mean specifically? I mean, uh, does it lead to any, you, I mean, what is, is it simply a mathematical uh, statement or? This is, uh, at the level of the linear response theory, I'm going to make a mathematical statement. So normally when you have a, well, and we are going to see an example in the third part of the talk, when you have a factory divergent series expansion, what normally happens is that you may have an order of optimal truncation, which would provide you with an exponentially good approximation to the underlying quantity you're going to, you want to represent. If this sort of oh, okay. is sufficiently high, yeah. So you know, we the uh, it's, it's good to have this factorial. Divergence yes, exactly. Because... So the point is that the factorial divergence enables to have, at least, opens the room for having a super asymptotic approximation, in the sense that the truncation error decreases exponentially fast with the particular with a particular parameter, which at the level of uh, taking a series expansion, truncating it, and applying it can be way better than the case in which the series expansion only com only converges actually because then the year no, but this is isn't it a bit counterintuitive because initial yes. data would need to have support at very high momentum whereas hydro is capturing low momentum behavior yes but, but here yes works, exactly yeah. but here yeah but remember that here we are talking about energy density and fluid velocity as defined by the microscopic theory so in principle there is no reason yeah. why the fields should have support yeah. only at low momentum states Yes, that's right. Yes, yeah. yeah, it's the exact expression of the TMU. So, yeah, exactly, exactly, okay. exactly. Uh, so, it's better to look for such uh, 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 such things. So, if in that case, hydro uh, the approach to hydro is better. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I sh actually, actually, th there is a yeah. In a sense, I think that I think that is morally true. There is actually a way of summarizing this observation, which goes under the names under the name of the careers rule which is, uh, I, let me see if I remember correctly. The statement would be that divergent series converge faster than convergent series because they don't have to converge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're yes, yes, very neatly yeah. this uh, competition between this, you know, this uh, fact that factorial divergence and optimal truncation, which provides an exponentially good approximations usually go hand in hand. No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So just okay, to illustrate, good, good. yeah. So just to illustrate the general convergence criterion. But but here the point, here uh, the main point is not the studying applicability of the gradient expansion at the level of linear response. The main point here is demonstrating that without any symmetry restrictions on underlying fluid flow, even at the level of linear response, you can demonstrate generically that the gradient expansion is factorially divergent under a, under a very mild condition, which is this condition on the momentum support in or the momentum space support. So just to illustrate the condition in practice, I have an example here, which is that of a shear channel fluctuation in Mueller refers to our theory. So the only important point here is that the only non-trivial component of the dissipative tensor is this one, which relativistic hydrodynamics would tell you has to be written in terms of the velocity fluctuation in the shear channel in this form. And now in MIS, you know explicitly the form of the shear channel frequency. So you can compute explicitly 
the transport coefficients appearing in this gradient expansion in terms of the parameters of the model, which allow you to find out what the critical momentum is. Okay. The critical momentum is given in this model. I'm going to come back to this uh, model, but the main fact is that the critical momentum for a shear, for, for the shear channel part of the gradient expansion is given in terms of the diffusion constant and the relaxation time by this expression. Now, the general analysis would predict that the gradient expansion evaluated on initial on a solution which has support in momentum space below this critical value would be convergent and otherwise it would be divergent. And if you compute, if you fix, you know, if you choose initial data with varying supporting momentum space and you compute explicitly this gradient expansion, you find precisely that this is what it happens, okay? So this is an example just to prove that the criterion works. And in particular, if you take the support to be unbounded, you find a factorial divergence as illustrated here in this fruit test plot. Okay, so uh, I already mentioned several take home points of this analysis, but I'm just going to emphasize them again. So the first one is that the physics governing the convergence of the position space constitutive relations and the convergence of the momentum space dispersion relations are one and the same. The second one is that nonlinearities or particular symmetry restrictions are not essential to get a factorial diverging gradient expansion. And the final point, which I think I already touched briefly upon, is that convergence of the gradient expansion has nothing to do, at least at the level of linear response, with the applicability of the gradient expansion when truncated at low orders. For instance, you can imagine that you have a state which is, you know, which has finite support in momentum space in such a way that the gradient expansion is going to be convergent, but that this state has a very sizable contribution for the non-hydrodynamic modes of the underlying microscopic theory. So in this case, even though the gradient expansion converges, the gradient expansion would not be applicable because it's not captured this uh, non-hydrodynamic mode contributions. On the other hand, you might imagine a situation in which the gradient expansion is divergent, but in which these non-hydrodynamic contributions to your uh, state are very suppressed. So in this case, the natural expectation is that the gradient expansion, when truncated at low order, is going to do a, is going to do a mm, good job in reproducing the underlying energy momentum tensor, even though the series does not converge. So at the level of linear response, you can completely separate these two notions in principle. Okay. So with this in mind, I'm going to move now to the fully nonlinear level and discuss first a new, ex new explicit computations of the gradient expansion in relativistic hydrodynamics beyond the realm of co-moving flows, okay? So the example I'm going to be focusing on is that of a longitudinal flow in BRS3 theory. So I'm going to tell you first what a longitudinal flow is, and now I'm going to tell you what BRS3, BRS3 theory is. Then I'm going to explain how to compute the gradient expansion in this particular model, and then I'm going to show you the results that we obtained. Okay, so in this part of the talk, we are going to be working in four-dimensional Minkowski space. And we are going to be focusing on longitudinal flows. So a longitudinal flow is a fluid flow, which like Bjorken flow, has non-trivial dynamics confined to a longitudinal plane, which is spanned here by the T and X coordinates. But that, unlike Bjorken flow, is not boost invariant in this longitudinal plane. So any longitudinal flow in four-dimensional Minkowski space can be parameterized in terms of the energy density, the fluid velocity, which is unit normalized and can be expressed in terms of a single degree of freedom, small u here. And furthermore, the dissipative tensor can also be expressed in terms of a single degree of freedom, which here we are taking to be the transverse transverse component, which we are naming pi star. So now these functions parameterizing this longitudinal flow, energy density, u and pi star, only depend on t and x. And since I'm going to be focusing on the case of conformal fluids in the remaining part of the talk, you will often see me trading the energy density by an effective out of equilibrium temperature defined in terms of the energy density by this expression here, okay? And uh, perhaps a useful way of thinking about the longitudinal flow is as nothing but a nonlinear sound wave. Okay. Now, uh, as I said, we are going to be computing the gradient expansion evaluated on longitudinal flows in BRS3 theory. So I'm going to tell you now what BRS3 theory is. So BRS3 theory is a phenomenological model 
in the Mueller Israel Stewart class of models, which is constructed with the objective of embedding second order relativistic heterodynamics in a framework which is compatible with relativistic causality, and in particular, a framework which has a which allows you to, to formulate a well posed initial value problem. So, the main idea behind the BRS3 theory or behind MIS theories in general is to promote the dissipative tensor to a set of independent dynamical degrees of freedom subject to their own equation of motion. So, here you have a schematic representation of this equation of motion in BRS3 theory. So, we take the algebraic relation between dissipative tensor and derivatives of the fluid flow variables that we have in the gradient expansion, we truncate it at second order, and then we promote this algebraic relation to an equation of motion of, the, of a relaxation form for pi mu nu. So in this equation of motion, you have a new parameter, which is the relaxation time, and which in a conformal, for a conformal fluid has to be inversely proportional to this local temperature defined before, just for dimensional analysis reasons, okay? And since we're dealing with conformal fluids, we are going to employ this um, bicovariant derivative introduced by log a, a while ago. <laughs> and well, here you have the standard shear tensor, which is the symmetric transverse and traces part of the gradient of the fluid velocity. And this is the shear viscosity, which again, in a conformal fluid, has to be proportional to the cubic power of this effective temperature in four dimensions. Now, the perspective we are going to take about this BRS3 theory is treating it as if it were a full-fledged microscopic theory. Okay, so we're going to imagine that BRS3 theory is a toy model that can teach us useful lessons about full-fledged microscopic theories such as ADS theory. And in particular, since we are going to think of BRS3 theory as a full-fledged microscopic theory, this theory is going to come with, it, with its own gradient expansion with an infinite number of terms. So to construct this gradient expansion, we are going to adopt the following approach. We are going to introduce a formal parameter epsilon by a homogeneous rescaling of the space-time coordinates that you can see here. We are going to put forward an ansatz for the um, non-trivial component of the dissipative tensor by star, which is going to take this form. So epsilon here, you have to think of epsilon as a bookkeeping parameter that counts the number of space-time derivatives. Okay, so the term of order n in the gradient expansion of pi star is going to come with an epsilon to the power. N. And now if you do this rescaling and you introduce these ansatz into the equation of motion obeyed by pi mu nu in our uh, mock microscopic theory, you find the following recursion relations for the coefficients of this gradient expansion, okay? And the usefulness for us in this part of the talk of these recursion relations is that they are going to allow us to evaluate the gradient expansion numerically up to, a, up to an order which is sufficiently high to assess uh, the asymptotic behavior of the gradient expansion. So the strategy is the following. We are going to choose initial data in BRS3 theory given by an initial profile of the temperature, fluid velocity, and pi star. We are going to solve the BRS3 equations of motion numerically, which are this relaxation equation for pi star and the conservation equation for the full energy momentum tensor. And then once that we have a solution in our mock microscopic theory, we're going to utilize these recursion relations to evaluate the gradient expansion at a particular space-time point. And here you have an example of such a procedure. And this example illustrates a general point that we found which is that irrespectively of the values of the shear viscosity of the relaxation time, irrespectively of the values of the initial data that you can see here, and irrespectively of the space-time space point being considered, we always found that the gradient expansion for this longitudinal non-commoving flow is factorially divergent, okay? So uh, here you can see, as I said, an example. So in the left panel, you have a density plot of the temperature, or which represents the out of equilibrium evolution of the energy density, and some fluid flow lines, which are represented by these solid black lines. And you see three selected points, okay? So one is a cross, another is a circle, and another is a diamond. 
So on the right panel, you have the root test as applied to the coefficients of the gradient expansion computed at each one of these points in space time. And what you see is that as a function of the order, this root test increases linearly, which implies that the gradient expansion is factorially divergent. Uh, I want to. Uh, sorry, what is the color code in your previous picture? The color code, yeah, the color code represents the the, the, the temperature, the effective temperature. So it's basically the fourth okay. of the energy density. Yes. I see. Yes. Thanks. So, so, so redder means a uh, higher over density, and, and you know, the more you go to the UV part of the spectrum, the smaller the temperature is. Mm. Okay. Okay, so uh, I want to emphasize uh, a point, uh, well, two points actually, uh, pertaining to this numerical computation. So the first one is if you want to find large order factorial growth up to an arbitrary, arbitrary high order of the rate expansion, you need to take the continuum limit. So you just in space time in order to be able to discretize them. So if you compute the gradient expansion up to large order for a fixed lattice size, what you would find is a region of lower uh, factorial growth at low orders that then is going to give way to a region of geometric growth at large order. This region of geometric growth exists because the lattice spacing is finite. And in order to find factorial growth up to all orders, you have to take the continuum limit. But I'm bringing this point up because it is a natural nonlinear counterpart of the statement I made before at the level of near response theory about finite momentum space support. So at the fully nonlinear level, if you introduce a momentum space cutoff in the form of a space-time lattice, you also find that the factorial growth uh, disappears at very, very large order. OK? And the second point I want to make is fundamentally a technical one, and is that in taking this continuum limit, it is essential that you take the numerical precision to infinity. Otherwise, uh, you are not going to be able to take it successfully. Okay. Okay. And I want to discuss now the, well, let me see how I'm doing with time first. Uh, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, just one question, Alex. So yes. in this, you need to choose the size of the lattice less than one over K star for this to happen. That's a very good question. And I think, OK, so our numerical experiments would show that the larger, no, OK, wait. K star would tell you, so having support below K star would tell you whether the series is convergent or geometrically divergent, right? OK. So the point here is that, for instance, in this example, you see that you have geometric growth at large order. But the series is not going to converge, basically because this asymptotic value is greater than one. Okay, so if you're asking me whether I can find k star in this nonlinear compute in this uh, fully nonlinear computation by choosing my lattice spacing in a clever way, I don't know. I think it's a very interesting question. We don't know. We haven't tried. Really. I see. Or maybe in the nonlinear case. Uh there is uh, no analog of uh, because uh, you would uh, i mean you would be producing other because you will producing other modes from the soft modes anyway it would be i don't know i mean yeah so um, yeah I, I honestly don't know i honestly don't know i think i think it's a it's an interesting point so yeah the uh, question is that uh, in the nonlinear in the nonlinear regime you do, do you see any any such uh, any such k star kind of uh, uh, from the initial conditions point of view or not that's uh, that uh, yeah that's uh, that's that's also another interesting point uh, and i have to say that i also don't know because you're asking me whether i can find you in the initial conditions in such a way that i can alter this large order factorial yeah growth. i don't yeah. know we have run order of hundreds of simulations of different you know with different initial conditions and we never found such a behavior because but but maybe we have some underlying bias in how we choose the initial data and we are not exploring that regime of parameter of you know phase space so i don't know i honestly don't know okay i i yeah i honestly don't know i yeah i don't know okay okay so uh 
I want to ask you now uh, how I'm doing with time because there is a part now that I can probably <laughs> skip if I'm not doing so well with time. Uh, so when when did we start? So uh, we you have ten minutes officially, but maybe you can take fifteen minutes, no problem. Okay, 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 okay. So what? Okay. So I think I'm going to take more. So I have a, a discussion here of this particular counter example to the general statement that the larger behavior of the gradient expansion of relativistic hydrodynamics was factorially was factorial growth for commuting flows. But I'm going to skip it just for the sake of um, yeah. I'm just going to skip it. I'm just going to jump to the singulars because I want to focus on them. And I, I'm probably going to take uh, at least um, 20 minutes if that's okay. Okay, so yeah, if you yeah, look at this fine. example, yeah, that, that's probably fine, right? Okay, so if you look at this example that I represented here, you will notice that the slope of the gradient expansion changes from a space-time point to a space-time point, right? So it turns out that you can think of this slope as being governed by an emergent collective field, which we are going to refer to as the singular. So what is the singular? Well, if you adopt the following factorial over power ansatz to describe the larger behavior of the gradient expansion coefficients, the singular, which is a field depending on a space time, is controlling the geometric correction to the leading order factorial, factorially growing behavior. And in particular, it controls the slope of the gradient expansion when evaluated at a given space time point through its norm. Okay. So in the remaining part of the talk, I just want to illustrate that singulars obey simple equations of motion, which are going to follow systematically from a set of basic rules. And no, so, so sorry, I don't, I don't understand something. So yes, uh, this, uh, this slope will also depend on the initial conditions, right? And on the initial, yeah, 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 of course. It and the singular field is also going to depend on the initial conditions, yes. Oh, I see. So, yeah. okay. So, I yeah. see. Interesting. So, the singular field, well, you're going to see an example right in a minute, but the singular field has a specific equation of motion that needs a specific initial conditions in order for it to be solved. Okay. Okay. So, um, as I said, what, what, what I'm going to illustrate is that the singulars are going to obey simple equations of motion, which are going to follow systematically from a set of basic rules. And that's the first point I want to bring home. And the second point I want to emphasize is that this singular equation of motion is going to reveal a direct correspondence between far from equilibrium, relativistic hydrodynamics, a linear response around global thermal equilibrium. So here I have a slide. So now for the sake of uh, not having you here uh, until very late, I'm just going to skip a few points. So here I have a slide discussing the set of rules from which the singular equation of motion follows. but we can leave it for the discussion session. And now we are going to focus on the more, the more uh, interesting uh, you know, development coming from this, this basic set of guiding principles, which is the singular equation of motion for a longitudinal flow in VR strict theory. So you can demonstrate that for any longitudinal flow in VR strict theory, the singular is going to obey this equation of motion. So the derivative of the singular along a particular fluid flow line is going to be governed by the inverse of the relaxation time evaluated at the local temperature at the space time point you are considering, okay? And this equation of motion can be cross-checked utilizing the explicit computation of the gradient expansion that we have performed. I'm sorry for this, this is a type. Okay, so you would start with the gradient expansion for pi star, which is, as we saw, is a factorially divergent series with a zero radius of convergence. Then we are going to take its Borel transform, which by construction uh, has a finite convergence radius. And finally, we are going to analytically continue to a function which is defined in the whole complex plane apart from a set of branch points and their corresponding branch cuts. Now, the singulars can be extracted as the branch points of this analytically continued Borel transform. And since we only know a finite number of terms, of the gradient expansion, in practice, we are going to employ by the approximants to perform this analytical continuation so that instead of seeing singulars as branch points, you're going to see singulars as points at which a line of polar condensation of the by the approximant starts. So I have here an example. So what you see here is 
and the Borel plane associated to the gradient expansion at a particular point in space time. And you see here that you have four lines of pole condensation uh, grouped in two complex conjugated pairs. So the points where these lines start are the singulants uh, you know, that govern the large order behavior of the gradient expansion at this particular space-time point. Okay. Now, due to their equation of motion, they're going to move to the right in the parallel plane. So they move in this direction that is signaled here by an arrow. And if you take, for instance, the singulant with the smallest norm, which I'm going to refer to as the dominant singulant, and you follow it along a given flow line as a function of time, you see that the value you extract numerically for this quantity matches precisely the singulant equation of motion that you have determined analytically using these basic rules. So this equation is actually realized in practice. Okay, So this describes the large order behavior that an explicit computation of the gradient expansion shows. And I also mentioned that mm, singulants, the singulant equation of motion, can be obtained from a linear response theory problem. So on general grounds, the linear response theory problem you have to solve in order to find the singulant equation of motion is the following. So you have, uh, I'm going to restrict it in this part of the talk to a theory of the MIS class, in the MIS, MIS class. Okay. So you have to take the equation of motion for pi mu nu in this MIS theory, in this case, it's going to be BRS3 theory, and find the dispersion relation for infinitesimal plane wave fluctuations of pi star, keeping the temperature and the fluid velocity fixed to a space-time independent constants. So if you find the dispersion relation for this problem, this map, which sends the global temperature to the local temperature at the point, the global fluid velocity to the local fluid velocity at the point, and the wave vector obeying the dispersion relation to the derivative of the singulant, you're going to recover the singulant equation of motion. And this is a general fact you can prove based on general principles. And I also want to emphasize that this linear response theory problem that you're seeing here can or can not, may, may or might not be equivalent to a computation of the sound channel modes of the underlying microscopic theory. So an example in which this linear response theory problem is equivalent to a computation of the sound channel modes is that of BRS3 theory. So in BRS3 theory, the linear response theory problem dual to the singular equation of motion is this one. And you can see that it transforms into the singular equation of motion under the map that I mentioned that you have here. On the other hand, in this theory, the sound channel modes are going to obey the following equation. And in particular, if you analyze this equation, you would find that there is a single non-hydrodynamic non mode, meaning that there's a single mode such that its frequency does not vanish when the spatial momentum does. And at zero spatial momentum, this frequency obeys this relationship here, which as you can see is equivalent to this equation, which as you can see is equivalent to the singular integration of motion under the map, in such a way that for any longitudinal flow in BRS3 theory, singulants are going to be governed by the non-hydrodynamic sound mode evaluated at zero momentum and at the local temperature of the fluid at the point you are considering. So this would imply that the behavior found in Bjorken flow in BRS3 theory is not regarding the relationship between the large order behavior of the gradient expansion and the non-hydrodynamic modes of the underlying microscopic theory, is not restricted to Bjorken flow, but rather applies to any longitudinal flow. Uh, I have a question, uh, Alex. Yes. So, because just to understand your the definition of the single end equation, uh, yes. so here you are somehow assuming that you can set uh, u to the local velocity and all of that. Uh, uh, but yes. then uh, this pi has only a pure time equation in time. It doesn't. You don't. You don't need to know about uh, the information about the of the fluid velocity in a neighborhood. Only at that point, right? Yes. Uh, uh, but this, uh, but in this way, is it possible to define it generally? It seems to be very specific to this BRS. This behavior, you're saying that this specific behavior is specific to BRS theory. Yeah, because in general, you can have uh, like derivatives acting on pi and. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, okay, let me let me be uh, let me be completely clear. So, so for lack of time, uh, I didn't have time into to dwell into this point. But on general grounds, to get the singular equation of motion. So the singular equation of motion is going to be ultra local 
in the fluid variables. So only the values of the fluid variables at a given space time point are going to matter. The derivatives are not going to enter. The spatial derivatives of pi star are not going to enter. The spatial derivatives of pi star are going to enter. The spatial derivatives of pi star, ah, OK. Yeah, so sorry, I thought you were talking about the spatial derivatives of the fluid velocity. So they're on a different status for this construction. So no, what no, I'm saying no, I'm not talking spatial derivatives or spatial derivatives. I'm only talking yes, about- Yes, they the are going stuff. to enter. And the point you're making is very, um, is very important because I'm going to discuss an example in a while in which we are going to find a difference between single and of motion and dispersion relation for some modes just for this reason that you're pointing out, that in BRS3, the equation of motion that pi mu nu obeys only involves longitudinal derivatives. So if you only have longitudinal derivatives, you have this relationship between singular and sequential of motion and non-hydrodynamic sound modes at zero momentum. If you include them in the relaxation equation of pi mu nu, this thing breaks. And I have an example in a couple of slides. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but then what you do, you have to, in, if it's not BRSSS, but some other theory, you have to somehow by hand ignore the spatial derivatives of pi star or? No, 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 you, you take them into account to find the single equation of motion and you find it. Okay, by okay, you're going to following this about general it. rule. It just so happens that the correspondence between this linear response problem and the computation of the sound modes breaks down. Yeah, yeah. So, no, but again, can you, could, could you just define what is the most general, uh, what, is the, what, is the, what is the algorithm that you get? So you, sub, you, you fix your u to be uh, the local fluid velocity and t. You don't need to never root information. And then you see the equation of motion of this non-hydrodynamic pi or yeah. whatever so, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, so what to do? Yeah. So in MIS, in MIS theory, uh, OK, so time permitting, I'm going to show you the corresponding argument in choreography. But, so, in an MIS theory, what you do for longitudinal flow in any MIS theory, what you do is fix t and u to some uh, space time independent constant, and then find the dispersion relation obeyed by this uh, plane wave fluctuation of pi star. Okay? Yeah, yeah. My only question is that if you look into the equation of pi star, you would expect derivatives of u and t also to enter in the, even in the linear response. If you, because if you are, this is the yeah, background, uh, right? I, I and believe, then you have to know the u and t in a neighborhood. No, but, but listen, listen, point. listen. So based on these general principles that I skip, those contributions would be sub. That, those would fix subleading corrections to the large to the leading order behavior of the brain. Oh, okay. Do not enter into the singular integration of motion, which remember only captures the leading geometric correction to the factorial growth. Okay, I see. So this, I see that. Yeah, okay. I agree with your point, but the point is that this co these corrections would come as solid in order with respect to the order at which you, the singular integration of motion appears. So that's oh, that's see. part of Thanks. the beauty of the, that's part of the beauty of this construction is that you can, for the purposes of determining the singular integration of motion, they don't matter. They would enter oh, okay. later. I see. I yeah. see. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah, exactly. okay. But it's a very, very, it's a very, it's a very good. It's a, it's a point that I didn't make, so I'm very glad that you brought it up because it, you know. I think it's important to, to, to clarify this. Good. So, uh, OK, so just coming back to the example of BRS3 theory, uh, what we have here, as I mentioned, is that for any longitudinal flow, not just Bjork and flow, the singulants are going to be governed by the sound mode evaluated at zero spatial momentum and at the local temperature of the fluid. And due to the positivity of the, sorry, due to the positivity of the relaxation time, the singulants are going to move to the right in the world plane. And this movement of the singular to the right uh, can be thought of in a very well-defined sense as the far from equilibrium counterpart of the decay of the non-hydrodynamic fluctuations around thermal equilibrium. And in particular, just coming back to the point about optimally truncated gradient expansion that we were discussing in the first part of the talk, as the dominant singular, meaning the singular with the smallest norm, moves towards the right in the world plane, for instance, because you are flow into the future along a particular uh, flow line, the optimal order of truncation of the gradient expansion is going to increase. And in fact, if you estimate what this optimal order of truncation is based only on the dominant singular, you are going to be led to an approximation which has a truncation error, which is going to track down the optimal one correctly. So here you have an example. So here we are following an observer which is moving along a particular flow line in an explicit solution of the BRS3 theory equations of motion. And you see, and well, the quantities are expressed in terms of this scaling variable, which if you remember from before, uh, governs how the real part of the singular is going to grow. Uh, 
due to the singular equation of motion that we found. So what you find is that if you place yourself at a particular time uh, along this flow line and evaluate the gradient expansion there, the coefficients of the gradient expansion first decrease until reaching a valley and then start increasing due to, due to, the, due to their factorial divergent nature. Now, if you decide to compute the partial sums of this factorial divergent series by stopping at the point that the dominant singular is telling you to do so, what you find is that the error you are making, quantified by the absolute value of the difference between the true pi star and the pi star you compute using this partial sum, is going to decrease with time in a way which is exponentially fast in this parameter and which is going to track down the best approximation that you can make, which is represented here by the black points. So this is a very neat way of seeing how the notion of singulants allow you to predict uh, how the, you, know, you should work with the gradient expansion in practice at the level of uh, optimally truncating it and so on. And now, uh, Coming back to the point that I have made, uh, so I have here an item which also produces his point, which is that in VRS3 theory, the single dynamics in a longitudinal flow is determined by the non heterodynamic sound mode frequency evaluated at zero momentum. And this is just purely due to the fact that the time union equation of motion only features longitudinal derivatives along the flow having this form. And this in particular is not generic. And it will not happen in the ADSGFT computation that I will discuss in a while, time permitting. So to find an explicit model in which we can, you know, we can spot the difference between single equation of motion and sound modes evaluated at zero momentum, we constructed a generalization of this uh, model previously put forward by uh, Michal, Janik, uh, Michal, and Vitaczyk in 2014 which is just a generalization. So the model, the HASW model, is just a generalization of BRS3 theory, which promotes the differential operator acting on pi mu nu from first to second order, but involving only uh, longitudinal derivatives. So what we did in our last paper is to generalize this model by supplementing it with this term, which involves only transverse derivatives. Okay. So you can apply the general set of rules given you the singular and equation of motion. And you would find that in this theory, the singular and equation of motion is going to take this form. So, oh, sorry, where u of chi is just the longitudinal derivative of chi and set of chi is set mu partial mu chi, where set is a vector field, which is uninormalized, purely longitudinal and orthogonal to you. So this is the singular and equation of motion. This is the uh, question, the dispersion relation coming from the associated a linear response problem. You can see that they are equivalent and are this map that I mentioned. But now in this theory, the sound modes are going to obey this dispersion relation. And the sound modes are evaluated at zero momentum are only going to be equivalent to the singular equation of motion, provided that this vector field acting on the singular is zero. But now this is not a generic condition. This places constraints on the specific form of the longitudinal flow you are considering and in particular implies that this correspondence is broken for general fluid flows a flow in which uh, this happens automatically is Bjorgen flow so in this model in this generalized hsw model there is a neat difference there's a clear-cut difference between the no hydrodynamic physics captured by the gradient expansion which depends crucially on whether you are considering Bjorgen flow or not Bjorgen flow if you've restrict yourself to be your flow, you would never spot this difference. Uh, well, this is the last example in which we actually managed to compute numerically the gradient expansion, extract the singulants by the procedure that I mentioned. Well, by a related procedure, by a procedure related to the one that I mentioned, to be technically correct, and to, cross, and to check uh, that the singular equation of motion that we predicted analytically is actually representing correctly the larger the behavior of the gradient expansion that we computed explicitly. And before uh, I'm going to flash you uh, the results of ADSFT in ADSFT that I have, but before I just want to point out that in order to understand the results, uh, there is a very precise interpretation of the linear response theory problem that computes the singular equation of motion. So to find this interpretation, you first have to note that for any four-dimensional conformal fluid, the equation of motion, the, well, the equation obeyed by the sound channel modes is bound to take this form in general, in which this quantity here, gamma s, 
is a function of the frequency and the three momentum squared and can be interpreted as a momentum dependent sound attenuation length, which is defined by this relationship here. Okay, so you just take, uh, so you go to Fourier space and you compute a, you know, how a fluctuation of pi star depends on a fluctuation of the fluid velocity and the proportionality factor between these two, which I guess can be interpreted as the retarded thermal two point function between these two objects, is this momentum dependent sound attenuation length. Now you can compute this quantity explicitly in the different MIS models that I mentioned, the RS3 and this generalized HSW model with the following result. And if you remember the equation dual to the singular equation of motion that I mentioned, this equation is computing nothing but the poles of this guy, okay? So in this particular formulation of the gradient expansion that we are uh, considering here, the singular equation of motion is fixed by the poles of gamma s, this momentum dependent south attenuation length. So in the last part of the talk, I'm just going to argue by an explicit analytical computation that this is also true in ADSCFD. Okay, so any questions? Uh, sorry, I mean, uh, yeah, just a snipe question. So in this way, it is, doesn't depend on the space-time point or, or does it? Uh, no, 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 so it depends on the space-time point. So, okay, so the equation, the equation then remember that the map maps global temperature to local temperature. Ah, temperature. okay, it's T0. That's how the dependence is, the T0. Yeah, so this is T0 and this is T0. So this frequency would become proportional to partial T, and then the you, T0 would become proportional you, okay. to local T. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so right. so it's actually, it's actually okay, basically so. when you compute the singular equation of motion, you're basically zooming in to the point. And, you know, you have to zoom into the point, lock the hydrodynamic variables to the values of the point, and then solve this problem. And that would tell you how the singular is going to evolve across space time. Yeah. OK, OK. So omega would be shifted by the frame, by the fluid frame. And then this, uh, this T0 would be the local temperature. And, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, exactly. And exactly. And, exactly. And exactly. Okay. Yeah. exactly. Exactly. So in holography, uh, I don't know how much I can, I can, depending on how many technical details you want, I can be faster. So I'm going to try to be fast. OK, so what we are going to do here is just an exercise in fluid gravity duality, both at the nonlinear level and at the linear response theory level. OK, so what we want is the gravity dual of a longitudinal flow. So we are going to employ this metric ansatz that was introduced in this paper by this TFR group of people. And we are going to employ some boundary coordinate system, which is adapted to our fluid flow. So this boundary coordinate system is such that the Minkowski metric takes this form with a fluid velocity, which is proportional to partial tau, when tau is our time-like coordinate, and an ortho orthonormal spatial vector to the fluid velocity, which is proportional to partial sigma, where sigma is our spatial coordinate in the longitudinal plane. And then these two are transverse spherical coordinates, and they're going to play no role in our construction, OK? So we are going to consider that we have infolding boundary conditions in the infrared, as usual. And as for the ultraviolet boundary conditions, we are just going to demand that the boundary metric takes this form, and that we are in a now frame which ultimately amounts to demanding that a specific co coordinate, a specific co sorry, a specific term in a near boundary expansion of this component of this covector field has to be zero. So in this construction, the energy momentum tensor of the dual CFT would have the following non-zero components, which you can see here. And the important point to keep in mind is that due to our definition of pi star. Pi star can be identified with a particular uh, component in the near boundary expansion of this function B parameterized in the metric. Okay, so this is the only fact you need to remember from this point. So if you compute the gradient expansion of the metric, you would have access to the gradient expansion of B and through the near boundary uh, expansion of this gradient expansion, you would have the gradient expansion of pi star. Okay. So the first step in order to compute the gradient expansion of the metric is a standard. So you just divide the Einstein equations into dynamical equations and constrained equations. The dynamical equations would allow you to express pi mu nu as a functional of energy density and fluid velocity. And you would you can think of them as the IDS CFT analog of the pi mu nu equation of motion, the RST theory. And the constrained equations are only going, I'm going to enforce the conservation of the dual energy momentum tensor. So now to construct the gradient expansion of the metric, we are just going to follow the standard fluid gravity procedure. We introduce again this auxiliary bookkeeping parameter epsilon, which is going to count the number of space time derivatives through this uh, homogeneous scaling of the boundary coordinates, keeping the radial coordinate untouched. 
Then you just put forward a formal power series ansatz for the different functions which parameterize the metric in terms of epsilon. Replace this into the dynamical equation, dynamical Einstein's equations with epsilon introduced. Expand around epsilon equals zero, and then you have a solution. Okay. So this is the reference background that you would find. Okay, where these functions a and b are introduced before, and this R H is going to be set by the energy density of the dual CFT state, and it's also only a function of uh, longitudinal plane coordinates. Right. So what we are going to do in holography, just to be absolutely clear, is that we have not computed the gradient expansion numerically for a longitudinal flow. What we are going to do is to take this construction and employ the analytic analytical tools that we have at our disposal in the form of the factorial overpower ansatz associated to the singulant, and find out whether a large charge factorial growth is self-consistent and what is the mm, singulant equation of motion that it predicts. Okay, so we are only going to perform one assumption, which is that uh, the singulant that we have is going to be independent of the metric component. So in this large charge ansatz for the gradient expansion of these functions parameterizing the metric, the singulant is not going to depend on the function. So if you assume this, the dynamical Einstein's equations combined with the general set of rules that we have at our disposal to compute the singular equation of motion would tell us that the singular is radial independent. And utilizing these basic rules, you would get that the singular equation of motion is fixed by this eigenvalue problem, which looks particularly unenlightening, but of which I just want you to remember uh, three basic facts. So the basic fact number one is that these equations that you see here which are the ADSFT analog of the singular equation of motion that we saw in MIS theories, are ultra local in the boundary coordinates. So if you want to evaluate these equations at a particular point, you are only going to need access to the hydrodynamic fields at the point and not to their boundary space and derivatives. Okay. The second point is that this equation for beta tau bar, which is just the uh, amplitude of the large orbital behavior of b tau. And similarly for the- So rest. if I understand correctly, you're isolating um, those parts of the equations of motion of this metric components to satisfy this condition that, uh, uh, that you do not need to know the derivatives of the velocity fields at the boundary, but only- Yeah, the... this comes automatically from the fact that you are assuming that the gradient expansion of the metric diverges factorially fast with a common singular. For all the okay, I understand. Functions. Understand. Yeah, okay, that's a consequence understand. of that. Yeah, that's a consequence of that. Good. That's a consequence mm -hmm. of that. Uh, okay, so first point: the ultra the equations are ultra local in the boundary coordinates, in the sense that at a given radial position in the bulk and given um, yeah, position in the boundary directions, they just depend on the hydrodynamic fields at the boundary. You know, the well, the given boundary coordinates, not on their boundary space and derivatives. Now, the equation for beta of bar is going to be decoupled from the equations of b bar and v sigma bar. So, you know, b bar only refers to b sigma bar and b sigma bar only refers to b bar. So these are the two that you have to focus on. And the final one is that imagining that you know you're at, at a given space time point and you know these functions a and b, which parameterize the metric in this curve coordinate system adapted to the fluid flow, Rh, which is related to the energy density of the dual CFT state. And this set of chi, which for us, remember, is just a derivative of the singular field along our spatial coordinate in the longitudinal plane. You can solve this eigenvalue problem with the appropriate boundary conditions and find what u of chi is, I mean, what is the derivative of the singular along a given fluid flow line. Okay? So this is basically an ADSCFT the generalization of the singular equation of motion. I emphasize this point that we see uh, that we saw before in BRS3 theory or this generalized CSW model. And now, uh, with these equations in mind, I just want to tell you how the eigenvalue problem that they're posing for u of chi is related to the poles of gamma s. So on this part, on this front, I have to do no work because in an almost direct way, the poles of gamma s in ADSCFT were computing by the work of Bowen Lublinsky in 2014, in which they studied all order linearized hydrodynamics. So, what these authors found, in a sense, were the exact constitutive relations of uh, the energy momentum tensor in ADSCFT in the linear response regime, which going, going back to the notation that I employed in the 
linear response theory part of the talk, take the following form. So in Fourier space, the um, dissipative tensor would be proportional to the shear tensor and this pi tensor, which we have seen before. And the proportionality constants would depend on the for well on the frequency and three momentum, and would be interpreted as dynamical moment, dynamical transport coefficients or momentum dependent transport coefficients. And as Buon Lublinsky showed, these objects here can be computed by solving a system of four couple radial ODs in a given black brain background. Okay. Now, if you remember the definition of gamma s that I showed before, you can show that this uh, momentum dependent transport coefficients introduced by Buon Lublinsky are related to gamma s in this simple way. Okay, so the method that these authors put forward to compute these two objects can be generalized to compute gamma s immediately. And we did this computation. Mm, and the only basic facts about gamma s in ADSCFT that I wanted to remember are that for a given spatial momentum, gamma s is going to be a meromorphic function of the of a complex frequency with an infinite number of simple poles, which are going to be symmetric around the imaginary frequency axis with a negative imaginary part. So structurally speaking, the poles of gamma s share the same features as the standard quasi-normal modes in the sound channel, but their specific numerical values are different. They are only going to agree at zero spatial momentum. OK? OK. So uh, it turns out that since we have access to the particular uh, system of uh, couple radial ODs that computes gamma s, we can introduce a very simple uh, ansatz into the functions appearing in this uh, ODE system to, to get an eigenvalue problem that computes the poles of gamma s for us. So the eigenvalue problem that's going to compute the poles of gamma s for us, we take this form and I leave it as an exercise for whoever is interested in this, but it turns out that if you remember the singular equation of motion in holography that we found, and if you compare it with this uh, system of coupled radial ODs that computes the poles of gamma s for us, for us, under this map, which is a natural generalization of the map that I showed you before in MIS models, the two equations map to each other. Okay. So structurally, this is extremely similar to our, you know, to our findings in MIS-like theories. And of course, what this shows uh, is that under our assumption of having a common singular parameterizing the relative behavior of olimetric components, uh, a large sort of factorial growth for an arbitrary longitudinal flow is self-consistent in holography. I would also say that based on previous results that we have in phenomenological models, the natural expectation that I, at least I personally have is that this factorial growth governed in this precise way by this singular equation of motion would show up in an explicit computation of the parent expansion. But this is the need needs to be checked because we have not still performed this computation. Okay. And I'm just going to leave you with some open questions. This is the final part of the talk with the last slide of the talk. So I would say that um, the notion of singulars opens many avenues for further exploration. And um, you know, these avenues would demand new explicit computations, like I just mentioned, and also new analytical insights. And on the questions that I find important, I want to highlight three of them. So the first one is whether there is a systematic way of relating the initial conditions for the singular fields to the initial data that we are considering. This touches directly uh, the question that Ajan asked me regarding how to fix how to you know, how to fix the initial conditions for the attractor at the very first part of the talk. And is if this systematic algorithm relating these two objects is exists, then one is naturally led to wonder whether, given the fact that we know the singular equation of motion, we can utilize this information to place constraints on the hydrodynamization time at a given space time point. But so far, we only made progress in answering this question in the linear response regime. The second point I want to mention before I conclude is that singulars uh, are defined with respect to a particular formulation of the gradient expansion, but the gradient expansion is not unique because we always have redundancies associated to the usage of the conservation equations and the possibility of performing free redefinitions. So 
A natural question that is still open is uh, what is the behavior of singulants in order gradient expansions, for instance, like the nonlinear version of the purely spatial gradient expansion that I considered in the first part of the talk, and that is only known uh, through the work of Kaplis and Rosdanov up to third order uh, at the fully nonlinear level. And uh, okay, and finally, we still need to explore singulants beyond longitudinal flows. Because, for instance, at this point, we don't even know if the large shuttle behavior for a generic fluid flow, uh, well, the large shuttle behavior of the brain expansion for a generic fluid flow is going to decompose into channels, which can be mapped to the natural channels that one has in linear response theory. So, with this, I would conclude and take some questions if you still have stamina. And thank you so much for the invitation for your time. Oh, thanks, Alex, for this very nice, uh, beautiful, and uh, very pedagogical talk, too. And, uh... Uh, so, since I have asked a lot of questions, I probably have no more to ask. Uh, so, uh, so questions, please. Okay, so I don't have maybe any further question, but just uh, uh, maybe to add to the list of your questions, open questions that you That's had. Great. Uh, <laughs> So usually this K star is, uh, I mean, uh, you are talking of the K star here, but uh, there's also some notion of omega star typically, because when you, if you analytically continue on omega and K, there is a, uh, you have, then there is, a, and then that, so from there you could find this Lyapunov of exponent and the butterfly velocity and all of that. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, so is there some notion of this omega star also, which you can extract from this? Uh, when you, you say know. omega star, you are referring to the frequency associated to K star or? Exactly. So normally what happens is that uh, it's, uh, okay. I mean, there are many ways to define it. It's, uh, you can also have this pole skipping behavior where if you analytically continue this, uh, um, this, uh, uh, this dispersion relation in both omega and K complex, uh, yeah. Then this uh, hydronomic mode meets with other quasi-normal modes, analytical continuation of other yes. quasi-normal modes at this omega yes. star k star, right? Yes. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I would like to uh, understand if uh, one can also bring in some notion of this omega star, this the where it collides with the other non-hydronomic modes uh, mm -hmm. in the complex. So, so you're asking this question at the level of the version of the gradient expansion, the purely spatial formulation of the gradient expansion that I presented in the linear response regime, or you're asking whether at the fully nonlinear level you can have a manifestation of this? So. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, both at the linear and the non-linear <laughs> level. So, yeah, so, okay. So, 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 so I think I think that if you, for instance, this is discussed in the appendix of this uh, 2020 paper that we have. Uh, at least in the appendix of P2. If you decide to consider a purely temporal formulation of the gradient expansion at the linear response theory level instead of a purely special one, okay? But here we consider a purely special one. So the transport coefficients appearing in it were naturally determined by dispersion relations uh, expressing frequency as function of three momentum, right? If you do the purely temporal one, the natural object yeah. that appears there would be a, a spatial three momentum squared as a function of frequency. So that's probably- so you have to a, reformulate your, your gradient expansion in a different way. Yeah, if, to, if you only use time derivatives to formulate it, then that's yeah, No, no, okay, I understand that. But suppose if we, suppose I want to pose this question on a non-linear level, and there it, uh, and we have the microscopic equations like in ADS CFT. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But then, then we don't need to do all of this. So fundamentally, how will you define such a thing? Okay, so you're asking. Mm, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't really know. Uh, what, what, what I can say is that depending on the particular usage you do, you make of um, redundancies, you can you know go from one formulation of the gradient expansion to another. So I would say that it's probably possible to have a formulation which this object plays a natural role, but I don't really know which for, what formulation this would be, to be so honest. I think this could be one of the very important open questions. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, just keeping, keeping follow, you know, just uh, dwelling on this point a little bit longer. I think, or at least I have the intuition or 
well, I don't know if it's wishful thinking or not, but my natural expectation would be that, you know, there is, has to be a natural way or a natural correspondence between different facts about, you know, hydrodynamic modes in linear response and the larger behavior of the gradient expansion or at least of a suitable formulation of the gradient expansion that makes some particular use of these redundancy security definitions. So for instance, you, you've seen here that in the particular, for the particular choice of collective fields that we are using, which is the, you know, the microscopic energy density and the fluid velocity associated to momentum flow, right? The large cell behavior of the gradient expansion evaluated at a given point is not related to the quasi-normal modes through this map, but only to the poles of this object gamma S. No, what? Okay, let let me just ask you the question a different way. So I think no, I was, uh, well, okay. I was uh, so you had some uh, ultra local version of these equations, right? Yes. And uh, in in general, you will also have the quasi normal mode poles and everything. But suppose yes. if I analytically continue this single length equation or whatever the linear version and version of it in okay, okay, in, okay, okay, in, okay. in in omega and k, I would by yeah. Sasso's method, I would find some place some complex omega and some complex k where they collide. Uh, and yes, uh, with that this, is right. That, uh, um, yes, yes, that, that, we actually computed that, uh, it's not published, but yeah, that would happen. Uh, that will happen, and that uh, the question is, what is the significance of this uh, physically? I mean, in terms of like, uh, uh, what is this omega, uh, like if I, if I, if I look into uh, your, uh, I should yeah. be able to see it from this uh, physical data, so some, uh, it should it should mean something. So that's what my me, question because yeah okay. So 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 just to just to keep elaborating, let me let me let me finish the point that I was making because I think it's related to what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so in this formulation, uh, we have large order behavior is at least in the three examples that I discussed. Uh, so two is established and one is a conjecture is linked to the poles of the mass, right? But you would like to have a relationship between large order behavior and uh, full fledged uh, standard quasi normal modes, right? So based on the general rules that determine the singular and, uh, dynamics, uh, what I would say is that if instead of working with these collective fields, you work with collective fields such that they solve the equations of motion of ideal hydro. So instead of, instead of if only, so if you don't only expand pi star, but you seek for a solution of, you know, the full uh, pi star, uh, U and energy density in terms of a gradient expansion, which would be some, in such a way that you know a living order you have the energy density and the fluid velocity solving the equations of motion of ideal hydron that would be the natural generalization of the let's say one over w expansion of the Bjorken flow and if you do that just based on the general rules determining the single equation the expectation is that the map that i discussed would still work but now would tell, take you from the single equation of motion to the quasi normal mode equation of motion okay mm -hmm. so if you if you want to find um Position space counterparts of phenomena yeah. you know from quasi normal modes yeah. in the complex momentum plane, you, you should probably work with this other formulation of the gradient expansion in order to be able to identify counterparts, natural counterparts between these two sides. Yeah. For instance, I, I, I know uh, regarding the formation that we used and regarding the poles of the mass. So, know that these subjects, uh, you know, if you take a pole and you analyze its dispersion relation as a function, you know, as an expansion in a small k. Yeah. So this has a finite convergence radius. It has to have a finite convergence radius because of relativistic causality. But if you're asking me what is the physical interpretation of the finite convergence radius or whether, you know, there's a sort of pole skipping in this object which has a nice physical interpretation, I don't know. I don't know. Mm. So we know such things for quasi normal modes. And then you should find the formulation of the gradient expansion in position space in such a way or such that the actual behavior uh, through the singulars, you know, governing the actual behavior, are naturally associated with quasi normal modes. So I think I think this ideal expansion in which you expand all the fields, not only just mm. the dissipative part in terms of the microscopic variables, but you expand everything, uh, you know, taking as reference the solution of ideal hydro, that would do the the the, the trick. And that that's more or less the reason that I uh, okay. So let me, let me uh, mm. yeah, that's more or less the reason that uh, yeah, this is so some question which I would put uh, under the umbrella of the second point, really. Mm. But yeah, it's totally open. I mean, it's totally open. So I, I, I cannot I cannot predict what would happen. I, I expect that mm. you you can get some non-trivial and beautiful results from such an approach, but yeah. Mm. Okay, so thanks. So let us close it now, but I can introduce you to Toshali, who is here still. Okay. And so let me close the recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is